Thank you everyone for subscribing to Infinitely Productions. If it is you have not done so, please click the bell and subscribe and we hope you enjoy our content. They make their living by murder. They're mob hitmen. This is their handiwork. All we did was just hunt people to kill them. No questions asked. The orders are orders. For the hitman, the mob takes precedence over everything. People in La Cosa Nostra understand that if a person needs to be murdered, he gets murdered, and that's that, that's business. But the hitman often lives at the very edge of death himself. If you screw up, you're going to get whacked. And every mob hitman carries secrets that are priceless to the government. Secrets that can do in even the most ruthless mafia don. He says, you're gone. And that's when I decide to turn. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, and mob warfare. In the 1980s, few people had a closer view of the bloody action than hitman Nicky the Crow Caramondi. The Crow admired the new and ruthless boss of the Philly mob, Nicodemo Scarfo. He was a good boss. He was a beautiful guy as a person, but when it came to business, it was strictly business. He had to kill certain people when he became boss, and he wanted these guys dead. Nicky the Crow had gotten into the Mafia slowly. A con artist by trade, he had spent most of his adult life gambling, stealing, and swindling. Not that the people are suckers, but they are suckers, because they're gullible for deals. Nick Caramadi is the quintessential South Philadelphia con man who, because of a lot of different circumstances, ended up being a wise guy. Nicky the Crow began as a junior mob associate, running scams for one of Scarfo's soldiers. His skills at ripping off suckers impressed Scarfo. Scarfo wanted not only to unify the Philadelphia Mafia, he wanted to run a smooth criminal enterprise. Nicky Caramondi was part of that plan. He soon became the Don's top moneymaker in the standard mob rackets, numbers, loan sharking, and extortion. We started to shake down bookmakers, drug dealers, anybody that does things illegal, we'd shake down. And if they didn't ante up the mob street tax, there was a higher price to pay. They had to pay tribute for our protection. If they didn't, it was this. That was my job. A job for which there was high demand in the regime of Boss Scarfo. Scarfo had come to power in 1981 after a hit on the old boss, Angelo Bruno. Bruno had been known as a peacemaker, not Scarfo. The new boss was determined to eliminate anyone who didn't like the way he did business. One of those holdouts was Harry the Hunchback Riccobini. When Scarfo took over, Scarfo wanted everybody paying tribute to him and under his thumb. And, and I think clearly the Riccobini faction balked at that. And that resulted in the war where you had Riccobini guys and Scarfo guys out roaming the streets of Philadelphia looking to shoot each other. Scarfo put contracts out on 70-year-old Harry the Hunchback and Harry's younger brothers, Sonny and Bobby. The boss made it clear that any of his soldiers should consider it their duty to rub out the troublesome Riccobini brothers. Nicky the Crow and a few of his mob associates took up the challenge, not for money, but for the chance it might offer them to advance within the crime family. You never get paid. There's no such thing as being paid for a hit. There's no such thing as outsiders that we hire to kill somebody. And for two years, all we did was just hunt people to kill them. Nicky the Crow's immediate superior was Pat the Cat Spirito, a veteran Scarfo soldier. Pat the Cat and Nicky the Crow, along with fellow hitman Charles Iadich, began plotting the murder of Sonny Riccobini. But the plotting began to run into problems. Every time the hit squad was ready to go kill Sonny, Pat the Cat would call it off. Nicky the Crow began to believe that Pat was dragging his feet. He was right. 
Pat gets drunk and starts talking treason. And he starts saying, hey, Scarfo's no good. These guys are no good. All they want you to do is kill, 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 kill. That's all we have to do is kill, kill, kill. I look at, I, I look at my partner and I say, hey, this guy's talking treason here. I don't want to hear this. Now, Nicky the Crow and his partner Charlie began to fear for their own lives. Scarfo was waiting for them to kill Sonny Riccobini, and the job wasn't getting done. They decided to go over Spirito's head and reported his treasonous talk to his boss, Salvatore Merlino. He says, you see, Pat, it's this. Take care of it. It's a good thing you guys come here because you guys were in a lot of trouble. That means this when he means trouble. Now, Nicky the Crow had to turn his gun on his mentor, Pat Spirito. It was kill or be killed. Nicky and his partner Charlie devised a scheme to hit Spirito. They would murder him during one of their planning sessions for the Sonny Riccobini hit. I was going to put a small 25 in my pocket. So Pat couldn't see it in my back pocket. I would be waiting outside my apartment house for him to pick me up and jump right in the car in the front seat. We would then go pick Charlie up. Nick Caramondi and Charlie Ian each told Pat they needed to drop off some loan shark money at this corner. When Pat pulled the car to the curb, they would shoot him and run to a getaway car. But there was a glitch in the plan. As we're going to the rendezvous point, what we're going to do it at, some lady trying to park a car and all kind of cars back up behind us. Charlie gets nervous. I'm nervous. We get to a corner. It's four corners. You got cars running north. You got cars running east. Charlie says, pull over here. Pat pulls over. He looks at me. I look at him. Now I'm waiting for Charlie. I got my hand on the door. All of a sudden, bang, and it made a hell of a noise. And Pat goes like this, right, like his head leans right to me. And Charlie pumps another one, bang. Pat the cat was dead. Now the two hitmen had to make their escape into crowded traffic, swarming with potential eyewitnesses. I jump out of the car. Charlie gets stuck behind the car. Charlie was a big muscular guy. <laughs> and I'm pulling them out. And we start to run to the getaway driver. There was another problem. The getaway driver didn't stop the car on cue. This guy keeps rolling with the car. Stop, you son of a bitch. We're screaming at the guy. I'm screaming at the guy. Charlie's in shock. Charlie jumps in the back. I jump in the front. Go, go, go. The final step of the hit was still to come. Nicky the Crow and his partner Charlie had to find alibis and get rid of the evidence. After you do something like that, you got to go to a house to get cleaned up, change your clothes because of the gunpowder. It gets under your fingernails, it gets on your clothes. And this is proof that the cops could use. You got to take a shower and you got to use vinegar, white vinegar. And you take the bath so all the stuff comes out of you. This all takes 15, 20 minutes. He goes and meets somebody. I go to this bar, and all of a sudden it comes on the 11 o'clock news. Mobster murdered. Oh, my best friend, and I start to cry. You know, oh, who killed him? Why would they kill him? You know, I'm putting an act on, and everybody knows it. It was Nicky the Crow's first hit, a murder that verified his loyalty and bolstered his standing in the Philadelphia mob. And there were more assignments to come. Without enforcers like Nicky the Crow Caramonde, the mob could not function. Mafia bosses must be able to follow through on their threats and teach a lesson no one will forget. Even the more peaceful dons must on occasion resort to murder. Otherwise, the daily business of the mob breaks down. Hollywood and popular culture have created an image of the mob hitman, a highly trained assassin who waits for contracts and then goes to work. The reality is that most rank-and-file mobsters can be called on to stalk and kill the enemy. Ruthlessness is an important qualification, but equally important is plain old convenience. 
The job of executioner often falls to whoever can get closest to the man marked for death. In the case of Pat the Cat's burrito, his killers were his own underlings. As we will see, the job can also be assigned to the target's best friend, or even his own brother. In 1982, South Philadelphia was on the verge of a gangland war. And the hitmen were out in force. Hitman Nicky the Crow Caramondi was doing battle for his boss, Philly's new godfather, Nicky Scarfo. We had a hit list. There might have been 15 people on our hit list. The captain would tell us, you, you guys go after this guy or this guy. See if you could find either this guy or this guy. Either one, kill him. Now it was time to follow through on their threats and wipe out the faction led by Harry Riccobini once and for all. When Scarfo took over, he didn't care what happened, where it happened, or who it happened to. Scarfo viewed Harry as a threat to his, uh, his leadership uh, and uh, started off by asking Harry's brother to set him up for the murder. Scarfo sent his number two man, Consigliere Frank Monti, to talk to Sonny Riccobini. Everyone in Philadelphia knew that Harry the Hunchback and his brother Sonny had problems getting along. And Sonny was in an ideal position to eliminate the Hunchback. But Sonny turned out to be a bad bet. Not only did he refuse, he told his brother Harry about the plan to double-cross him. I was surprised that they would even try that. <laughs> and, uh, well, we got, I got together with my friends and uh, planned what to do. So Harry killed uh, the messenger. He killed the consigliere. Scarfo's number two, Frank Monte, was gunned down by a young Riccobini associate. It was the first fatality in the war. Scarfo was furious. He wanted Harry the Hunchback dead. The word went out. Any and all Scarfo soldiers had standing orders to wipe out the Riccobini gang if they could. Once the order is out that this guy's got to go, it could take a day, it could take a month, it could take a year, but he's going to get killed. Finally, in June, they got a shot at him. I was in the phone booth making a phone call. And I saw, from a distance, a rather shabby-looking guy walking along towards the phone. The shabby-looking guy was a Scarfo associate, 24-year-old Salvatore Weenie Grande. I knew it was something wrong. You could sense it. He came right to the phone booth. His arms start coming up with a pistol in his hand. Well, I saw that and I jumped on him. <laughs> I grabbed one hand with him with one hand. I grabbed him one hand. I grabbed the arm with the pistol, and he shot me. And he grazed. He hit me in here. The first shot. The bullet didn't slow Harry down. Instead, the older man grabbed for the hitman's gun. By that time, we were tussling. Not that I'm a strong man or a big man, but uh, I, I did all right. I set him back a few steps, and uh, he shot again and missed. I grabbed him again. I took the gun off him. Well, lucky for him, it was empty. But not knowing it, I went to... Hey, you son of a bitch. <laughs> At that point, Grande ran. Harry was hospitalized for his wounds, but survived. Two months later, the Scarfo hitmen struck again. I was parked in the car waiting for a party, and uh, I, hear, I heard footsteps. So I looked around, I see another guy. He's got a mask on. I said, huh, maybe this is it. And as he brought the gun up, I ducked under, under the dashboard. He shot and shot the windows, but uh, nothing happened. He just shattered the windows, and he ran. It was really kind of a game of, it was, you know, when you're a kid and you're playing cops and robbers. I mean, these guys were out there looking for each other, trying to set each other up, and out to kill each other. They stopped stalking, because then they knew we, that I was ready for them. In fact, I was, I used to go out alone, hoping they would show up, but they never did. Scarfo's hit team went looking for another target. Nicky the Crow Caramondi set out to kill Riccobini associate Frank Martinez. The Crow stalked Martinez and monitored his every move. We watched him the morning before go to work. We've seen what time he gets up. The light goes on upstairs, then the light goes off. 
upstairs and it comes on downstairs. Once they had their targets routine down cold, they made their move. Three hitmen moved into action. Charlie Ianich, Gino Milano, and Nicky the Crow. There comes Martinez out of the house, gets in the truck, Charlie runs in front of the truck, fires four times directly into the truck. He hit him in the shoulder and the chest, and Gino comes running up and he pumps the whole five boats from the 38 into the truck. They run to the car and we go. Miraculously, Martinez survived. Scarfo was losing his battle against the Riccobini crime family. Cops and reporters were starting to refer to Scarfo's men as the gang that couldn't shoot straight. Scarfo's famous temper was rising out of control. He wanted these guys dead. So he handpicked the target that would hurt Harry the Hunchback the most, his brother, Bobby Riccobini. This time, there was no margin for error. It was like four teams that went out. It was like three, four guys in each team. One team was headed by Scarfo soldier Faffy Inarella. He hunted down Bobby Riccobini on the street. Now what Faffy does, he gets the shotgun, he walks up the street, and he's laying, he's ducking. You know, here comes Bobby and his mother. Faffy starts running toward them. The mother starts screaming. She grabbed the gun and, you know, she tussled with him. He butts her with the gun. Bobby starts running. It's pretty chubby, chunky, and he's jumping over the fence. And Faffy shot him with the shotgun. Bobby Riccobini died on the sidewalk in front of his mother. I never dreamt of that. They killed one of my brother, another brother of mine. They said that's enough. If the robber got killed, Robert Riccobini got killed. They said that's enough. Harry the Hunchback surrendered his territory to Nicky Scarfo. The war was over for now. Typically, only one or two hitmen are contracted to kill. But Nicodemo Scarfo choreographed a massive attack of hit squads on the Riccobinis. His regular use of his loyal troops earned him a reputation as the most dangerous mafia don in the country. But the next hit on his list was a real challenge. Scarfo's hitmen had to figure out how to murder a widely respected and extremely cautious mob captain. In 1984, mob hitman Nicky the Crow Caramondi was living the high life in the underworld. We'd go to a restaurant and they would prepare certain foods for us and everything was special. I mean, we used to spend four or five thousand dollars for dinner. Okay, we used to have big dinners, champagne. Nicky the Crow and his hitman buddies were celebrating the victory they had won for their boss, little Nicky Scarfo, over his enemies, the Riccobini family. With the Riccobinis out of the way, the hitmen could turn their attention from murder to making money. And their vicious reputation certainly made it easier to collect. In reality, we did anything we wanted to do. But Scarfo wasn't satisfied with success. The paranoid boss never stopped fearing treason from within his ranks. Six months after the end of the Riccobini War, that fear focused on an unlikely suspect, his most loyal captain, Salvatore Testa. Salvi Testa was probably the most charismatic wise guy in Philadelphia. He was the mob prince of Philadelphia. Scarfo, for whatever reason, decided that Salvi Testa was a threat to him. And I think it was his own paranoia because he saw who Salvi Testa was. Scarfo became suspicious of Testa, thought that he may be a rival. Well, surprise, surprise, what do you think is going to happen? Nicky ordered his hit. They called me and Charlie out and they said, Salvi's got to go made the sign of the gun. The reasons given for killing Testa were vague. It was only clear that Testa was out of favor with the boss, Scarfo. He wouldn't marry the young boss's daughter, and they start saying he was in the drug business and this and that. Hey, orders are orders. He's not doing the right thing. He's got to go. That's it. But it would not be easy. Salvi Testa was himself an experienced hitman and knew all the moves. We tried 17 different times in front of his house. Salvi was hip. He knew he was going to get it, but he didn't know who. Now, every time he would see you, he would shake your hand and pat you down, bring you close to feel if you had a gun. I think Salvi knew that he had a problem, uh, but I'm not sure he realized how bad a problem it was. But Salvi Testa was too loyal or too blind to go into hiding. 
He stuck around Philadelphia, moving cautiously, and somehow avoiding a bullet from Nicky the Crow. So Scarfo switched to a new strategy. He approached Testa's circle of closest friends. He wanted someone close to set Testa up for the kill. If they refused to do it, well then they were probably the next one was going to get killed. And so they really don't have a choice once they get involved in that. The top candidate for this betrayal was Joseph Pungitore. Even though he and Salvi Testa had been friends since childhood, Pungitore set up Testa for the murder. On the pretext of straightening out a gambling debt, Pungitore took Salvi Testa to a meeting at this candy store on South Philly's Pashunk Avenue. Waiting inside was Salvatore Winnie Grande, the same hitman who tried and failed to kill Harry the Hunchback Riccobini in a phone booth. It's an empty store. Salvi walks in. Winnie's got the gun, hidden here. Gives him the shake, pass him down, and Salvi turns around for a minute to face Joe Punch. He shoots him in the head. Salvi Testa never saw it coming. He was dead in a matter of minutes. He laid there for seven hours. Later that night, me, Charlie, and another fellow go get the body, we wrap him. It's full, full of blood in this store. Removing the body was tricky. Salvi Testa was a big man, six feet two inches tall, and weighed more than 200 pounds. It was pretty heavy. So what I did, I got a kid. I gave him a signal to put the car in the middle of the street and open up the hood so no cars could get down while we take the body out so in case a cop is passing by, you know, and threw him in the truck of the car and uh, drove him to Jersey and just threw him on the side of the road. Another successful hit for Scarfo's assassins. But Testa's murder was also the beginning of the end for Nicky Scarfo. By killing one of the most admired wise guys in the Philly mob, Scarfo had finally gone too far. That sent a signal, too, to the organization and, and to the guys who had been around for a long time. If Scarfo can kill Salvi Testa, he can kill anybody. Even veteran hitman Nicky the Crow Caramondi, who had helped eliminate Salvi Testa, was haunted by Testa's death. It killed me. I used to get nightmares. I used to wake up screaming. I loved the guy. There was just a fondness uh, that I grew about, and he used to love me. In 1986, Nicky the Crow was arrested for shaking down a Philadelphia real estate developer. While in jail, he got word from a fellow mobster that Scarfo was displeased with him, and that could mean only one thing. He says, it's this. You're gone. I said, but why? That's all I could tell you, he said. And that's when I decided to turn. It took me like three days to think about it. I knew once Scarfo put something in his head that you were gone. There's nothing you could do about it. Nicky the Crow called the FBI and turned from hitman to rat. It was symptomatic of the distrust that, that was inherent uh, in the Scarfo family. They didn't necessarily feel part of a unified family. It was, you know, everyone for himself, basically. Years as a loyal hitman had made Nicky the Crow a priceless witness. He spilled the beans to the FBI. And in 1987, Nicky Scarfo was arrested and charged with extortion and murder. Nicky the Crow Caramondi took the stand and told the jury everything he knew about Scarfo's murderous regime. His testimony came across as truthful. I thought it came across as compelling. We were able to successfully convince the jury that the mob that was in the courtroom, and the mobsters committed all these particular crimes. Nicky the Crow Caramonde joined the witness protection program. Nicky Scarfo was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Murder is part of mafia life. It's a price gangsters pay to live in a world of high profits and little work. And as with many parts of mob life, there are rules for hitmen as well. Each killing must be properly authorized by the boss. Signing such death warrants turned out to be a task for which Scarfo's successor would show real talent. Look closely. You are witnessing a mob hit in progress. Three hitmen are entering this Philadelphia diner armed with handguns. <laughs> As the gunmen leave, they take one last look at their victim, who lies bleeding on the floor. Then they jump in a waiting car. 
No one is ever charged, but everyone agrees it was a mob hit. It was 1993. Once again, mob hitmen were armed and headed into battle. A battle over who would fill the power vacuum left when little Nicky Scarfo went to prison. This time, the hitmen would not only kill one another, they would begin to tear down the mob's very structure in Philadelphia. On one side, the forces of mob kingpin John Stanfa, who had the blessing of the New York mob. Lined up against Stanfa, skinny Joey Merlino, Stanfa's one-time soldier and now his rival. Police believe it was skinny Joey Merlino who ordered the hit at the diner. The target was Stanfa's second-in-command, Joe Cingalini. Although Cingalini survived, he was crippled. Stanfa demanded revenge. He ordered the murder both of Merlino and of Merlino's number two man, who just happened to be Joe Cingalini's brother, Mike. The two brothers in opposing mob factions were sworn enemies. Stanford personally outlined the plan for killing the two men. Openly orchestrating a hit is a peculiar move for a mafia don. Usually the boss lets an underling give the actual order, just in case the FBI might be listening in. But Stanford did it himself. Bad move. The FBI was listening as Stanford and a soldier switching back and forth between English and Italian, planned Merlino's murder. The FBI must warn any potential victim of a murder if it knows of a plot against his life. And agents did alert skinny Joey Merlino. Merlino ignored the warning. Meanwhile, to carry out the contract against skinny Joey Merlino, Stanfa chose a young mafia wannabe named John Vesey. John Vesey was a South Philly, uh, born and bred neighborhood tough guy. And uh, he wasn't very big, but he was, he was tough. Vesey quickly teamed up with another young would-be mafioso, Philip Coletti. By day, Coletti was a legitimate plumber. By night, a mob hitman. No one in his nearby New Jersey town of Glassboro suspected the double life. A lot of people didn't know. All of our neighbors loved us. We were constantly working on the house, having barbecues. Every kid in the neighborhood was at our house. This was very normal. And then there was the dark side. Now, the interesting thing about Phil Coletti is not only Phil Coletti, but his wife, Brenda. Brenda, the former uh, nude go-go dancer, is involved in the plots to kill Merlino and the Merlino Associates. It was very unusual. Women aren't supposed to be part of this. They're not supposed to hear things. Or, or if they do, they don't get involved and they just play dumb. But I felt honored. I felt privileged. I enjoyed it. I had a burning desire to be part of it. That thrill and that danger. The Coletti home was used as a think tank for the hits. They would come over, I'd be cooking my macaronis and pouring the wine, and we would just be sitting there eating and drinking and, and plotting these things. The question was how to kill Berlino and his number two man. One of the schemes even included Brenda herself. The plan was for Brenda, armed with poison in an eyedropper, to visit Berlino's favorite hangout. I was like, I thought about it. I was going to get all dressed up, really sharp, you know, try and look all young and sexy. Ha ha ha. Go down there and uh, shoot some cyanide into their drinks. I had more balls than half the guys that was working for John Stanford. But the cyanide plot was vetoed. Instead, the hit team decided to build a bomb. They called their bomb the egg. Lucky for Merlino, the egg was a dud. The hit team placed it under Merlino's car, and nothing happened. It's in a box under the car. It won't go off. The car pulls out. It's dragging the box with the bomb underneath it. So in August 1993, Philip Coletti and John Vesey decided to use the time-honored mafia method, plain old bullets. 
as skinny Joey Merlino and his second-in-command walked out of their favorite hangout at 6th and Catherine, Galetti and Vesey opened fire. Michael Cingalini died on the spot. And they wounded Joey Merlino, shot him in the butt, and then they took off. Merlino survived. The hitmen ran for cover at Coletti's mother's house. Then Brenda helped them destroy the rented getaway car so that it could not be traced. We drove a few blocks away, and they took the car. It was a brand new Taurus, and they torched it. Brenda reported the car stolen. As far as the hitmen were concerned, their message had been delivered. Don't mess with John Stanfa. But instead, the attempt on Merlino's life set off a chaotic, all-out mafia war. Stanfa's hitmen, expecting a retribution hit from the Merlino camp, planned their strategy. Like a football team, they studied a videotape of the other side. One of Stanford's bodyguards got a videotape of Mike Cingalini's funeral from a Philadelphia TV station. Skinny Joey Merlino struck first. A month after he was wounded, Merlino supposedly ignored the rule against involving family members in mob violence and allegedly ordered John Stanford's son murdered. 23-year-old Joe Stanford was shot in the head while caught in traffic on a Philadelphia highway. He survived, but it sent his father reeling. Not surprisingly, Stanford demanded retribution. The old man was very upset, and his son just got shot in the head. And he was very distraught, and he said uh, to Philip, I want you to go out and kill this guy and kill his son. So John Vesey went out and murdered a member of the Merlino faction, Frankie Baldino. To the police, it was just one more corpse in the ongoing gangland war. But not for Vesey. It would be the hitman's last kill on behalf of the mob. His next target would be the boss himself. Mob hitmen can be dangerous in more ways than one. They are the keepers of valuable mafia secrets, the kind of secrets prosecutors will pay for, when and how a murder was carried out, and who gave the order to do it. But in switching allegiance, of course, the hunter then himself becomes the hunted. For a mob hitman, John Vesey was sitting pretty in 1993. He had killed two mafia rivals for his boss, tough Sicilian-born John Stanford. He was a killer on his way to the top. And then something unusual happened to John Vesey. He had a change of heart. It was Vesey's own brother, Billy, who began to persuade John that he had chosen the wrong path in life. So John Vesey, at his brother's urging, went to the FBI and began negotiations to become a government witness against his boss, John Stanford. Stanford realized Vesey was going to turn. He ordered the hitman killed. We knew that they were going to kill John John, you know. We knew they were going to kill John John before Christmas of uh, 93 because he was opening his mouth and he was just shooting his mouth off. John John doesn't always use his head. He's just very wild. He's, he's a little nuts, but he's a good guy. Two of Stanford's thugs called Vesey to a meeting above this butcher shop, saying they were going to train him to run Stanford's gambling operation. Well, one guy's going over some paperwork and Vesey's sitting there. The other guy goes to the bathroom, just like in The Godfather, gets the gun that was hidden in the bathroom, comes out and walks up behind Vesey and says, bye-bye, John. The hitman put the gun right to Vesey's head. Vesey would later testify in court about what happened next. He said, bye, John. Bow, bow, bow. He shot me later several times on every time. With my friends, I didn't think they would shoot. I said, I'll turn around and smoke, right? What the f*** is wrong? I was a little, like, you know, stunned. Vesey shot in the head. Vesey was still standing despite two 22 caliber bullets in his skull. He managed to fight off his assassin. Vesey escaped from the death trap and ran straight to the FBI. Now it was time for his partners, Philip and Brenda Coletti, to get nervous. We knew if they were going to take out John John, they were going to take out us. Philip was very streetwise. He knew what was going on better than I did. 
And especially after they tried to kill John John, he knew it. I mean, we, Philip knew too much. If he flipped, there was just too much information stored in his brain that could hurt a lot of people. He always, you know, told them that he would be faithful and remain faithful to them and whatnot. But that doesn't mean anything. If they want to take you out, they'll, 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 just, they'll do it, you know? Savisi's partners joined their fellow hitman in breaking Omerta, the Mafia Code of Silence. John Vesey and Philip and Brenda Coletti all became witnesses for the government. If you're faced with a choice of either cooperating with the government or being dead, uh, that's not that hard of a, uh, of a decision. We have to leave everything behind and you cut your ties and you, you lose so much, you sacrifice so much. But, you know, it's something that we wanted to do. You, we were wrong, now we have to pay for our mistakes. In the fall of 1995, Philadelphia's godfather John Stanfa went on trial for murder. But before the Colettis and John Vesey even testified, Stanfa got revenge the only way he knew how. Hitmen went after Vesey's brother Billy, who had convinced him to turn away from crime. He comes out of his house, he gets into his vehicle, and he drives down to the end of the street. And at that time, he's approached, uh, numerous shots are fired. And uh, his car actually travels across the Oregon Avenue and, and runs into a house and stops. So it's early morning in South Philadelphia, and, uh, you know, they just come out and they opened up on him. The brother of John Vesey was killed on a street corner in South Philadelphia on the day Vesey was to take the stand. Everyone perceived that as a warning to Vesey. I mean, Vesey went ahead and testified anyway, but what it said was, you know, you want to hurt us, everybody's at risk. Vesey told the jury how he followed Stanford's orders in killing Mike Cingalini and in trying to kill skinny Joey Merlino. We drove down the street, Michael and Joey were walking back on the south side of the street. Phil said, jump in the back, I jumped in the back. With the window down, we both shot out the window. What did you see? I see Michael Cingalini spin around on the floor. Go back up, fall down again, Joe Molino running back and forth. BC painted a vivid portrait of the sadistic enforcement tactics used in South Philly's underworld. A believable tale, since he was one of the enforcers. He explained how in one confrontation he tackled an enemy hitman with a power tool. When he came in the house, I sat him down, I smacked the paint with a the, the drill. Then I started drawing. I asked, you ready to kill me? You know what I mean? I, I drove him a few more times. I started to on his chest, his legs, on the side of his head, to rip his hair out, and we pull out chunks of hair with the rotation. I hit him with a bat in the knee. Prosecutors believe that Vesey, despite the raw brutality of these admissions on the witness stand, managed to strike a chord with the jury. The jurors loved John Vesey. He was a street corner rock contour. He had that kind of that, that, that wise guy charm. Uh, he was, you, you, you have to see him, you have to picture John Belushi, samurai hitman in the witness stand if you want to understand what John Vesey was like. And the jurors loved it. And he was self-effacing and he was uh, straightforward and he didn't, he didn't coat who he was or what he did and he just laid it all out there. Vesey's partner, Philip Coletti, told the jury about his efforts to kill Merlino with a bomb on Stanford's orders. Most of the time we put under his car. He always parked in the same place. And uh, a couple of times there's a little brick wall over here. And we put in trash in front of the brick wall. So, you know, he would walk by and get a better view. And who actually pressed the button? I pressed the button. Coletti and Vizi were persuasive witnesses. The jury believed that John Stanfa had given these orders to his hitmen. The verdict was guilty. And there were more guilty verdicts to come. So far we've convicted 11 made members of La Cosa Nostra, including the boss, consigliere, capo, and members of uh, the Philadelphia family of La Cosa Nostra in this prosecution, and it's been highly successful. Yeah, well, we've got a, you know, we've got a, a bunch of them in jail. There's a bunch of them dead. Uh, some of them are disabled. It's just not a good line of work. John Stanford was sent to prison for life. 
He was blamed for two murders after his hitmen turned on him. Nicky Scarfo, also a sentence of life without parole. Fifteen mobsters died during Scarfo's tenure as head of the Philadelphia Mafia. Even Harry the Hunchback, Scarfo's archenemy, ended up with a life sentence. The Hunchback was betrayed by one of his hitmen and was convicted of murder. He was afraid he was going to get convicted and get 12 years, which he might have and he might not have. So he, he, he settled to become a witness. Had he come back and talked to me or discussed things, I didn't care why he did it. He did it because he, you know, he, he didn't want to go to jail. I don't believe in sour grapes. The mob wars in Philadelphia took a gruesome toll. Between 1980 and 1995, the FBI estimates that out of 50 full members or made guys at the top of the Philly mob, 29 were murdered, all in the name of La Cosa Nostra, Italian for this thing of ours. This thing of ours comes first, comes before your family, comes before your kids, comes before your mother, comes before anything. If you got to kill your own brother, that's what you got to do. Because this thing is first. When you take your vows, this comes first. Nick the Crow Caramondi confessed to participating in three murders, a requirement of his deal with the feds. I was afraid of the judge. Because this guy hears about murder, 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 he ain't going to let me go. And he gave me to work more time than anybody got. I got the most time out of everybody. He wanted to give me 50. He didn't even want to let me go. He wanted to give me 50 years. He said, if I can give you 100 years, I'll give you 100 years. But in the end, all the Crow had to serve for his three murders was 13 months in prison. When his time was done, Caramondi entered the Federal Witness Relocation Program. He took up a new identity and began a new life. But his old hitman caution prevailed. Garamandi didn't trust the U.S. Marshals to protect him, so he dropped out of the program, deciding to spend his life on the run. Awful. <laughs> How do I feel? <laughs> Awful. You gotta live with, uh, you know, with one eye behind your head. You gotta watch yourself. You gotta be careful. I don't think he's particularly happy where he is. And if you talk to guys on the corner now, they say, well, good, good, because he's, he's a rat and he deserves anything bad that befalls him. Brenda and Philip Coletti also entered the witness relocation program. But Brenda was thrown out by the marshal service after she appeared on a television program. Now Brenda is on the run. I feel like a, a walking target. They don't take too kindly to rats walking around right under your nose. That's like a slap in the face to them. I've heard, you know, people on the street telling me, you know, uh, for me, uh, they probably would get great, uh, a big thrill out of torturing me first because, uh, like I said, I'm in this area. They don't appreciate a rat right under their nose. It's a major insult. That is a slap in the face. And I'm here, and I'm smearing it in their faces. And, uh, of course, they want me dead, too. When you're a rat, you're a rat. Your name is dirt. That's it. There is no turning back. You are scum. <laughs> That's the way it is. Turncoats like Nick Caramondi, John Vesey, and the Colettis are much more common today than they were even 20 years ago. Thanks to hitmen ratting out, the older generation of gangsters, those who survived the street battles, are mostly behind bars. Ironically, these law enforcement successes are partly to blame for the vicious behavior of today's mobsters. According to police, the new generation of mafia hitmen respects few, if any, of the old rules. Gangsters' families have become targets, a practice that would have been unthinkable even among the toughest mafiosi a couple of decades ago. These changes may also reflect an all-too-modern heartlessness. But one thing is clear. More than ever before, Dispatching the hitman has become the first resort in the mob, not the last.
Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel and check out more of our content. Feel free to give your feedback and suggestions on what we should do next in the comments. This is Infinite Lee Productions. We love ya.